I'm going to invite you to take a seat and to grab your Bibles or your Bible apps and turn to the book of Romans chapter 3. Romans chapter 3 is our text today as we're continuing our study in the book of Romans, uh, a book filled with wisdom and truth that, uh, that God wants us to know and to live by and let it change our lives. If you don't have a Bible with you, that is perfectly fine. Grab one of the Bibles in the seats around you. Turn to page 1118 and you will find Romans chapter 3 right there for you. Uh, also, if you're here and you don't have a Bible and you want one, then please take one of these. It is our gift to you. We want you to have the Word of God and read the Word of God because we know if you do that, then God will change your life. Uh, and that's what we're all about here at Calvary. Hey, uh, I've got some good news and some bad news. What do you want to hear first? See, it's kind of a mixture. How many of you are good news first people? You want the good news first. Okay, I see those hands. That's right. How many of you would rather have the bad news first? Yeah, a lot more hands <laughs> go up. I'm a bad news first person too. I want to get the pain out of the way. I want to end on a positive note. I think that's why I work out in the morning, right? Get all the bad news out of the way. Now you can enjoy the rest of the day kind of thing. So like, that's how I'm wired anyway. But we're going to start with the bad news because that's where our passage today starts with. It starts with the bad news. And the bad news is this. We are all guilty before God. We are all guilty before God. Romans chapter 3, the Apostle Paul picks up where he left off in the previous chapter. He says, then what advantage has the Jew? Or what is the value of circumcision? Much in every way. To begin with, the Jews were entrusted with the oracles of God. What if some were unfaithful? Does their faithlessness nullify the faithfulness of God? By no means. Let God be true, though everyone were a liar, as it is written, that you may be justified in your words and prevail when you are judged. But if our unrighteousness serves to show the righteousness of God, what shall we say? That God is unrighteous to inflict wrath on us? I'm speaking in a human way. By no means. For then how could God judge the world? But if through my lie God's truth abounds to his glory, why am I still being condemned as a sinner? And why not do evil that good may come? As some people slanderously charge us with saying, their condemnation would be just. What then? Are we Jews any better off? No, not at all. For we have already charged that all, both Jews and Greeks, are under sin. As it is written, none is righteous. No, not one. No one understands. No one seeks for God. All have turned aside. Together they have become worthless. No one does good, not even one. Their throat is an open grave. They use their tongues to deceive. The venom of asps is under their lips. Their mouth is full of curses and bitterness. Their feet are swift to shed blood. In their paths are ruin and misery and the way of peace they have not known. There is no fear of God before their eyes. Now we know that whatever the law says, it speaks to those who are under the law so that every mouth may be stopped and the whole world may be held accountable to God. For by works of the law, no human being will be justified in his sight since through the law comes knowledge of sin. The bad news is we are all guilty before God. The bad news is, left on our own, we are doomed. We have no hope. It doesn't matter if you are religious or an atheist, if you're a law-abiding citizen or a criminal. It doesn't matter if you uh, are sober or an addict, faithful or faithless, reliable or a flake. We're guilty. We are guilty. Uh, did you catch this? None is righteous. No, not one. Not one. See, the Apostle Paul wants us to grasp this truth. And if you've been here the last few weeks prior to this one, you're probably going, hey, are we ever going to get past this whole guilty thing? Because in chapter 2, he says, hey, why are you judging people? Because you're, you're, you, if you judge others, you're judged the same way. You know, it's, it's going to apply to you. And then he says, you who condemn others for certain sins, you're doing the same stuff, so you got to stop doing that. And he comes back in chapter 3, and he's hammering us on this whole, hey, guys, you're guilty. Because we have to grasp the bad news in order to get to the good news. We really have got to understand this before we move on. And, and in this passage, the Apostle Paul specifically addresses two dangers that can keep us, prevent us from grasping the bad news. If you will, there are two forms of denial that we are tempted to practice one way or another. Uh, the first danger or first denial is pride, spiritual pride. 
Uh, you notice the Apostle Paul is talking about the Jews. You know, is it any advantage to being a Jew? Is it any, does it matter if you're a Jew? And, and see, here's the, the reality. There were a lot of Jews in the early church that thought they were better. They, they, they thought that they were spiritually were, were closer to God because of their history. I mean, these were the chosen people, right? The, the God revealed himself to the Israelites the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. God established them as a nature, freeing them from slavery in Egypt through these incredible miracles, signs, and wonders that he did to, to make them a nation. He, he gave them the law. He, he sent them prophets. And, and then he brought Messiah through them to save the whole world. So, of course, they were better than those ignorant, lawless Gentiles. Except they weren't. They weren't. They're guilty. Some of us can be prone to spiritual pride. Uh, I mean, after all, we're Americans, right? And we're Christians. And some of us were raised in the church and we were baptized young and we memorized scripture. Some of us can even find Obadiah in the Bible without table of contents. I mean, and, and, and you're moral, you're proper, you're modest, you're holy, and on top of all that, you even tithe. I mean, you really believe the Bible is the Word of God, and you really believe that you're better than those nasty, immoral, biblically illiterate sinners. Only you're not. You're guilty. Before God, you're guilty. Hey, did, did you notice verse 20? That this, this is kind of clear, kind of blunt. For by works of the law, no human being will be justified in his sight. Okay, how many human beings are in the room? Oh, that's pretty much everybody. Now I know who's sleeping if you didn't raise your hand. Um, <laughs> by the works of the law, no human being will be justified in God's sight. I, I mean, that's pretty plain. That's pretty all-inclusive. And, and what it's saying is, hey, guys, we're guilty. We're filthy sinners. I, I like to use the phrase, I'm a scum-sucking pig sinner. Because I know the filth that's in my heart. I know the evil that's there. I, I understand that I'm guilty. And, and I was thinking about this sermon while I was doing my least favorite chore of the week. Um, I don't know what your least favorite chore of the week is, but uh, hey, how, many, how many of you have dogs? Yeah, okay, you guys understand that. These precious little furry creatures that we love, they treat our backyards like toilets. <laughs> have you guys noticed that? And so it's my job, since my kids are grown, to uh, now pick up the poop once a week because it's trash day, got grandkids coming over, and hate doing it, but I, I got to do it. So I thank God for those little grabber things, right? You know what I'm talking about? You don't have to touch it anymore. So it's, uh, it's brilliant. But I'm out there and I'm, I'm doing my chore that I loathe and, and uh, picking up the poop, but I really hate the ones that the flies are really attracted to. You know what I'm talking about? There's just like a whole fly party going on there. And it occurred to me when I was writing this sermon and I was doing my chores that that we're, you know, the, if, if we're filled with spiritual pride, if we really think we're better than those other people, those sinners stuff, we're like the fly on top of the poop <laughs> that's looking down on the flies on the bottom and going, you people are sick. <laughs> and the reality is we're all insects on dung before God, okay? So we got no reason to be proud. Um, we're guilty. And then the other danger that the apostle mentions is indulgence. Indulgence. Uh, maybe you noticed this reference. Maybe you wondered about it. And he said in verse 7, but if through my lie God's truth abounds to his glory, why am I still being condemned as a sinner? Why not do evil that good may come? Why not do evil that good may come? See, this is the danger of saying my sin is no big deal. God's grace is awesome, so I'll just indulge my desires and do whatever I want to do. There was a group of people in the early church who actually taught that and practiced that. Uh, they were, uh, it, the movement was called antinomianism, which translates to no law people. They just didn't believe in law. And, and their philosophy was, hey, when I sin, God's grace abounds, so I'll just sin more so there's more grace, and, and that'll be all cool. Except it's not. God's grace is awesome, but we do not sin to show off the grace of God. That's messed up. So we're guilty. We're all guilty. We're all doomed. Every one of us deserves 
hell. Every one of us deserves punishment. We deserve suffering because we've disobeyed God, because we've rebelled against God, because we've defied God. Are you feeling lousy yet? Because are you guys ready for the good news? Okay, because see, the bad news is we're all guilty before God, but the good news is grace is for everyone. Grace is for everyone. The apostle continues, verse 21, but now, now the righteousness of God has been manifested apart from the law, although the law and the prophets bear witness to it. The righteousness of God through faith in Jesus Christ for all who believe. For there is no distinction, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God and are justified by God's grace as a gift through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus, whom God put forward as a propitiation by his blood to be received by faith. This was to show God's righteousness because in his divine forbearance he had passed over former sins. It was to show his righteousness at the present time so that he might be just and the justifier of the one who has faith in Jesus. You see, the good news is that grace is for everyone. So let's recap. The bad news is all are sinners, but the good news is all can be forgiven. Got that? All of us are sinners. All of us can be forgiven. So the good news trumps the bad news. So we all deserve hell, but heaven is available to us. We all are guilty, but there is a pardon waiting with your name on it because of Jesus. Did you catch that? This this was repetitive in this passage. The righteousness of God through faith in Jesus Christ for all who believe. And we are all justified by his grace as a gift through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus, whom God put forward as a propitiation by his blood. To be received by faith. You know what that means? It's big words, but it basically means that when Jesus was on the cross, when he was suffering and dying on the cross, that his life, his blood paid for your debt. See, in our rebellion, we incurred a debt, if you will, a a, a price that we could not pay back. We were helpless and hopeless, and, and Jesus literally paid that as he hung there and died for your sins and my sins. That's what he was doing, and that's what that means, that in his blood, he paid the debt for us. So just let me be incredibly direct. Jesus is the sacrifice that paid for your sins and my sins, period. Jesus' death and resurrection provided atonement for our wrongs. And it's all because of Jesus. That's why here at Calvary, our mission is to lead people to a life-changing relationship with Jesus Christ. It's our mission, it's our calling, it's our priority, it's not an option. Because only Jesus Christ can change lives and forgive sins. And it's not about going to church, it's not about being a good person, it's not about following the rules, it's all about Jesus because grace is a gift. It cannot be earned, it cannot be deserved, it cannot be purchased Grace is available to us, salvation is available to us, forgiveness is available to us as a gift from God. All right, I'm going to take you back to verse 20. It sums up the bad news. For by the works of the law, no human being will be justified in God's sight. Again, I want that, we got to be clear with this. You can't be good enough to go to heaven, ever, period. You can't do enough good deeds to go to heaven. You cannot attend church enough, give enough offerings, or make enough sacrifices to go to heaven. It's not going to happen. You can only receive the gift of grace by believing in Jesus. That's it. It it means to be justified by your faith. Again, did you catch this? I'm just going to repeat these. In, In verses 21 through 26, it says it over and over and over again. The righteousness of God through faith in Jesus Christ for all who believe. And we are justified by his grace as a gift through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus. See, it's it's what Jesus did for us. That's the gift. You can only receive that gift by believing in Christ. So right now, are you secure in your eternal destiny because you have faith in Jesus? Or are you still trying to earn your salvation by doing good deeds and working really hard and hoping that you're good enough? have conversations with people about God a lot, and uh, when it comes to eternal life, uh, 
people will often say things like, I hope I'm good enough to make it. And I'm always, you know, the, the you know, bluebird of happiness, and so I say, you're, you're not. <laughs> you're not. You're not good enough to make it. I'm not good enough to make it. We're not good enough to make it. If that's what you're leaning into, you're not going to make it. And, and so you've got to stop trying to make it. And you've simply got to trust Jesus to do what you can't do. That's why it's a gift. And if you're sitting here today going, well, I don't know if I'm going to make it or not, then, then have a conversation with God that goes something like this. God, I know I can't be good enough to make it. I know I can't earn this on my own. I know I can't do this. I need you to help me. I need you to save me. I need you to forgive me. He'll do it. The gift is for you. He wants to redeem your life. He wants you to come to that place where you receive the gift and allow his grace and mercy to wash over your soul and to change your life. But you can't do anything to, to get it. You just have to say yes to it and place your faith and hope in Jesus. So again, the bad news is we're guilty. You can't get there on your own. The good news is God's grace is for everyone even you, even you. See, I'm pretty sure there's some of you in this room that are sitting here going, yeah, God's grace is for everyone but me. God's grace is for you. And some of you need to hear that. Some of you need to just read this passage over and over and over again, uh, especially verses 21 through 26, and understand that God's grace is for you. And in the morning, you need to get up and you need to look in the mirror and say, God's grace is for me. Because Jesus loves me and Jesus died for me and I am forgiven because of Jesus. Not because I'm this good person, but because God offers me grace. His grace is for you. But you have to receive the gift. And when we receive the gift of grace, then grace results in gratitude and obedience in our lives. See, grace changes us. I, I want you to experience grace. I want you to know grace. And grace changes us. And by the way, if you're not sure that you've received the grace of God, can I just say that at the end of the service, members of our prayer team are going to be here at the front, and they would love to talk with you, pray with you about a relationship with Jesus and how you can know that you're forgiven. Pastors will be available at the Connection Centers. We would love to talk with you. We don't want you to leave without having your questions about grace answered because grace is life-changing, and it results in gratitude and obedience. Now, when I say results, I mean there's evidence of grace in our lives through gratitude and obedience. Let's talk about gratitude uh, because it's one of those evidences uh, of grace in our lives. Because when we know that we've received, let me just get the word right. When we know that we've received undeserved favor from God, we're grateful. I mean, come on, let's just boil it down. If you know that you deserve hell, but God's given you heaven, how can you not be grateful? I mean, everything else is, is incidental compared to that. That is the ultimate reality that changes our, our attitude, our perspective on life. And so when you know that, it starts happening that gratefulness and thanksgiving overflow out of your life. In other words, uh, you're, just, you're just grateful because of what God has done. So are you grateful? Are you thankful without being prompted. So here's the catch, right? Without being prompted. How many of you uh, have kids or grandkids or were a kid? <laughs> yeah, that's pretty much everybody. It, it does apply. So those of you that, that are older, your kids or your grandkids are little, and, and somebody pays them a compliment, that's a pretty dress you have on, by your handsome young man, or they give them a toy or a candy, right? Or we give them cookies out here. And, and as a parent, you're, you're waiting, you're hoping for a response from your kids that doesn't come, and you kind of prompt them a little bit, and you say, and what do you say? Right? We, we've all done that. Hopefully, your kids are not as tall as you when you're still doing that. What do you say? You know, because you want them to be grateful, but that's prompting them. If you ask people, hey, are you grateful? Oh, yeah, I'm, I'm grateful, I'm grateful. But are you a person of gratitude when you're not being prompted? It kind of looks like this. Last month, I had the, the privilege of attending the Masters Golf Tournament. If you're not a golfer, you don't care. But if you're a golfer, it's like the Super Bowl of golf. And, uh, and I got to go because uh, my wife is gracious. 
her family's had tickets for 40 years, so every now and then she takes me. And uh, it's just grace. I don't deserve to be there. I'm just happy to be there. And uh, it's Sunday, and on the, we sat on the 16th tee. And if you're a golfer, you care. If you're not, you don't like, so what? And, and uh, so it's a great location. We had these great seats. We're, we're watching it. But these people that were like the security guards for the, the stands, um, they kept getting in the way. Like, they kept wandering out of their position, like, to see, and I'm like, I can't see, move, get out of the way, you know? And, and I was starting to get irritated inside, like, you know, calling them names and stuff in my head. And uh, <laughs> I know you guys will never do that, but I do. And so I'm like, get out of the way, morons, you can't, and, and then it just dawned on me, it just occurred to me, I, I don't have any reason to be angry. I'm sitting at the 16th tea at the Masters on Sunday, and I'm just happy to be here. I'm just grateful that I get this privilege, even if some people who are being inconsiderate block my view from time to time. So uh, I just kind of was stopped and went, God, thank you. Uh, Is the grace in your life evident through your gratitude? If you're not sure that you're naturally grateful or, or, you know, or whether you're only grateful when you're prompted, ask the people around you people that love you, people that know you. See what they say. Because grace results in gratitude, and grace results in obedience. It results in obedience. Verse 31 of this chapter says, Do we then overthrow the law by this faith? By no means. On the contrary, we uphold the law. We uphold the law. For those who are tempted by indulgence, please hear this. God wants to protect us from destruction. That's why he gave us the law. The law is a guardrail to keep us from crashing our lives. In other words, God gave us his wisdom to teach us how to live and to bless us day in and day out. And so we'd understand not just how to please him, but how to, you know, live lives that are not self-destructive. And so grace results in us being grateful and obedient. Now, the obedience part is a sticking point for a lot of us that grew up in legalistic churches. You know, the churches where they try to use the Bible to control you, you have to do this. If you don't do this, you're going to go to hell. You got to, you know, and they, they kind of make it scary and threaten you and say, if you don't do this, God's going to be mad at you. He's going to be angry at you. And, and the, the thing is, grace-filled lives don't want to use the Bible that way. They want to use God's word to bless people, not try to control people. And, uh, and there's a huge difference. But I know a lot of times we talk about obedience. People go, oh, you're saying I have to do this. No. I'm not saying you have to do anything. What I'm saying is that when you understand the goodness of God that he offers to forgive all your sins and wipe clean the slate and take you to heaven and you haven't done a thing to deserve that, that you start wanting to trust Jesus with your day in and day out life. Let me put it this way. If you are a follower of Jesus Christ, okay, if you believe that Jesus is the Son of God, Savior of the world, you believe he died on the cross to pay for your sins, was raised from the dead, you've made a commitment to follow Jesus, then you, by definition, are trusting Jesus with your future, right? Because you expect Jesus to forgive your sins and take you to heaven, right? And, and uh, since you're not in heaven right now, that's a future event, okay? You know, the, the idea is that you're going to die one day and you're going to go to heaven when you die, get a new body, praise God, and, and eternal life, and it's going to be awesome. So that's a, now I know some of you are like, do I have to do the death part? That's up to God, okay? I'm not making any promises there, but that's up to God. But see, the thing is, we're trusting God with our future. Jesus has our future. We trust him with that. Do you know what obedience is? Obedience is trusting God with the present. It's saying, Jesus, I know that you love me and you're for me, and so I believe you, and I'm going to do what you say to do because I know that you're for me and not against me, and so I'm going to take this book that you've written for me, and I'm going to learn what it says. I'm going to do what it says because I'm going to trust you today and in the future. That, that's what it, it means. It's kind of like this. Play a game with me here for a minute. Let's just suppose that somehow I came up with about, I don't know, half a billion dollars and someone gave it to me. And, uh, and I decided I was going to share it with you. I was going to give everybody a million dollars on the way out the door today. You guys for that? Okay, good. So you guys, some of you are like, yes, I'm going to come back to this church. <laughs> so I'm at the door handing out the, the bundles of million dollars because, you know, who wants to check that you have to go down and see if it clears, right? So... Uh, 
I'm just handing out the cash. And uh, first of all, are you guys grateful for that gift? Yeah, you would be, right? You wouldn't, you wouldn't be like, only a million, I'll get two. No, you'd be like, hey, thanks. And, and by the way, if, I mean, as I'm giving this to you, I say, hey, I got uh, two things I want to say. First one is simply a request. Would you give away 100000 to other people who don't deserve it? Is anybody going to have a problem with that? No, because no, you're like, I still got 900000 I didn't do anything to deserve. Perfect. Okay, so I ask you to give away 100000 You're not annoyed. You're not offended by that request because you're grateful. And then secondly, I go, hey, here's some counsel. I'm just going to give you some advice about where to invest it. You don't have to listen to it, but here's, here's where I think a great investment is. Maybe you should consider that. You might listen to that counsel from a person who just handed you a million dollars cash. True? Jesus has given us something worth far more than any amount of money. He's given us freedom and forgiveness, and he paid for it with his own blood. And he's promised to forgive all your sins if you'll believe in him and take you to heaven and make you a child of God forever. And he says, by the way, I've got some suggestions for how to live your life that will incredibly bless you while you're here. Why in the world wouldn't you trust him with the present as well as the future. You see, grace, when we've really experienced grace, it is seen in our gratitude and it's seen in our obedience because it changes our lives. I've shared some good news and I've shared some bad news. My prayer is that the good news defines your life. Will you pray with me?